Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, and this is part of a series of short videos in which I'm answering questions from my Patreon supporters. And Other Barry asked about my doctoral dissertation, The Historical Development of Basic Color Terms in Old Norse Icelandic, and whether I could flesh that out a little bit. Well, I've talked a little bit about my color research in other videos, and I've often gotten really long-winded about it. So I thought that I might make a video intended to be short. That's just, how did an Old Norse speaker view colors? Well, let's look at a color wheel. I'll put in a color wheel from somewhere on the internet. An English speaker divides this into a red, an orange, a yellow, a green, a blue, a purple. Some people distinguish purple from indigo. I don't really see it. Some people will mark out a particular pink area. Uh, but broadly speaking, an English speaker will point to some spot or another on there, you know, with a laser pointer or whatever, and uh, another English speaker will look at the same spot and uh, agree, yeah, that's red or orange or yellow or green or whatever. Those are our basic color terms, those zones. Now within those zones, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, you can find distinctions of shade or hue, you know, it's a lighter yellow, that's a darker red, that's a forest green versus that's a sage green, that kind of thing. But a forest green and a sage green are both green. So the category is green. So what I'm interested in, in the field of color semantics, is what are those top level categories? And surprisingly, uh, for some people anyway, I guess it surprised me when I first started to think about it 15 years ago, different languages have different top level categories. So from my research, which involved reading effectively everything written in Old Norse and writing down every single occurrence of a color term and what it was for and how it was talked about, whether it was used in you know, rhyme or alliterations, maybe it was chosen just because of poetic purposes, whatever. After all of that research over the course of three, four years, I concluded that an Old Norse speaker would look at that color wheel where an English speaker sees red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, so six things at minimum, it sees three things at the top level. There's just a red zone, a green zone, and a blue zone. Now, just like an English speaker, an Old Norse speaker who's not colorblind sees the same distinctions of particular little hues, right? An Old Norse speaker can distinguish between that darker red, that lighter red, or whatever. But the difference is what that top level categorization is because to an Old Norse speaker, orange and yellow are kinds of red. That does not mean that they're stupid. It does not mean that they can't see the difference between yellow and red. It means that they don't need to talk about that as a top level distinction, right? There's not, I mean, it's a, this is a little disingenuous to say that the natural environment conditions this because it, it doesn't necessarily. You'll find people in the tropics that have 11 basic color terms next to people um, speaking a related language with three basic color terms. So the environment doesn't necessarily condition this, but the environment can make it somewhat more understandable. In a lot of environments, and it's, you know, certainly in like medieval Iceland, what is red or orange or yellow that the distinction is gonna matter to you, right? I, I don't think that the environment is the only factor here, but the environment may be a contributing factor and they're just being like, what, what are you distinguishing these things for? There's no economic reason. And this is a world where you're not choosing between, I don't know, uh, 25 different colors of, you know, phone cases or whatever, right? Where, you know, well, I want the, the Rufus orange, but I want the tangerine orange or whatever, right? That, that, there's just not that many 
modern products that have all these different colors. Most things are just natural color. And if you look at the natural environment, like maybe the one that I'm in right now, what colors do you see, right? Color isn't really how you're distinguishing between things here. I see some junipers that are kind of dark green, some sage that are kind of light green, rocks that are brown, some rocks that are a different kind of brown, some lichen on them that are a different kind of brown, maybe kind of greenish, and then the sky is blue. But if I'm describing the landscape to somebody, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna say, I don't know, it's rocky, right? And there's some junipers on it. Color doesn't really come into it. Most of, I think, our really elaborate color terms apply to the products of industrial technology, right? Painted things, plastic things, um, different colors of cars and like some phone cases and stuff like that. So in their environment, they don't need to talk about this much. Hey folks, we'll be back to your regular presentation in a moment, but for right now, I'm here at Grimfrost World Headquarters Longhouse with Johan Hegg, and I just want to remind you that if you have Viking needs, you have a Viking supplier. Grimfrost really cares about getting things right. And if you need replica, well, anything, right? Shields, helmets, weapons, board games, uh, cool t-shirts, hats, all sorts of accessories like that. You can get them at grimfrost.com together with my books and they ship just about anywhere in the world. So check them out. It does help support the channel. Now, one thing they need to talk about a little bit more is the color of hair, because of course we often describe other people and the color of you know their hair, eyes, whatever uh, is part of that description. And they do have a somewhat richer uh, vocabulary for that. But it's still true to say that any given hue that is on that color wheel can be reduced to one of those three categories. That is to say that a person, I know this is kind of surprising, but in Old Norse, a person who is blonde and a person who is red haired, they both fundamentally are red haired. I know it's sort of odd to think about because this is not how we talk about it but you can specify that they're blonde. And to specify that they're blonde, you say guler. Now guler is then a kind of red in the same way that like tangerine orange is a kind of orange in English or forest green is a kind of green, right? They, you can imagine a language where forest green is called um, riv and um, Sage green is called dur, right? And a speaker who thinks of forest green as riv and, and sage green as dur is surprised that we call both of them green. And, but then vice versa, we can see the distinction that the riv dur distinction is making. We just don't need to make that a category in English. So same thing with their distinction between red and yellow. Now yellow or blonde is guler in hair, but it's bleker in something else. That's the general word for something that's yellow. But because what's really being communicated by Blaker is not yellow per se, but the fact that it's a warm color that is not truly red, as in like blood red, Blaker can also, and again, this seems odd, but uh, this is how it works. Blaker can also mean pink because that's also a warm color that's not, you know, blood red. This leads to an interesting situation in modern Icelandic where blekkur, the modern descendant of that word, means pink generally, but it does mean a yellowish color when you're talking about horses. So often um, color terms as used about farm animals have a more conservative meaning than is used elsewhere in a language. It's not just true of Icelandic. By the way, this distinction between a color that means red, like canonically red, and then warm color and that can mean yellow or, or pink. Not common in Indo-European languages, but uh, there are some North American languages that, uh, that border on that kind of system too, so it's not unknown. Um, now, there is a common misconception that Old Norse does not have a word for blue. This misconception originates from the fact that Old Norse poets typically call ravens blue. Not 100% of the time, they do sometimes call them dark or black, but they usually call them blue. And because ravens are stereotypically black in English and other modern languages, 
modern translators usually just render both black and blue, svarter and blor, as black. However, Old Norse writers consistently distinguish between blue and black, blor and svarter, for instance, in the color of people's eyes. And uh, the sky on a clear day is blue. So I am convinced that blue, blor, does in fact mean blue, and that ravens are called blue by poets because the poets are good observers of the natural world. Take a look at a raven. They have a nice blue sheen to their feathers. In prose, ravens are called svarter, black. So calling ravens blue is uh, poets being poets. It's not untrue. It's a very nice observation and uh, it's easy to observe for yourself if you look at one close up. Or if you don't have ravens in your area, look at a crow or the black feathers on a magpie. It's very similar. Now, if we look at the non-chromatic colors, black, white, gray, the distinctions there are basically the same as they are in English. Svarte, huite, kror. Kror is hor, just like English hoar frost or hoary old, uh, if it's used of gray hair. And then there's brown, which is pretty hard to find on that color wheel or on that achromatic spectrum. But you know, all the hues of the natural world, all your rocks and animals and shades of brown hair, the word for that, that is brun, and it is yarper if used of hair, especially human hair in old Icelandic, but in modern Icelandic, that word is mostly used of horse hair. So there you have, in short, the basic color terms of Old Norse. The chromatic color wheel can be broken into three basic zones, red, green, and blue, which by the way, Snorri says are the three colors of the rainbow, Bivros, and it does have three colors as far as an Old Norse perspective is concerned. Again, the fact that it can be broken into three categories does not mean they cannot see the difference between particular hues in those categories, just like we can see the difference between particular shades and hues within our own categories. The brown is brown, and then black, white, gray are divided much like in English. When talking about colors that are warm, but not characteristically red, i.e. not blood red, Old Norse has a term bleker, which therefore can be translated as yellow or pink, depending on context. And when talking about blonde human hair, there's the special term guler. Gray human hair has the special term hor and brown human hair has the special term yarpar. And that is how Old Norse categorizes colors in short. Well, I appreciate the support from Patreon. I appreciate those of you checking out the new edition of my translation of the Poetic Edda. And from beautiful Wyoming, I'm wishing you all the best.